video will pan out to show the inside of the, the building with everything rolling. Oftentimes, people ask me, say, Steele, how's come you ever started this horrible thing of collecting antiques? What's, what ignited your desire to do that? I said, I can tell you exactly. Underneath the Christmas tree was a package about so big. And I had a habit of shaking, and I shook this one. It was from Margie. I couldn't figure out what it was. So she said, open it. Well, I took the cover off, and here was a hobo cigar box. I thought, she know I doesn't smoke cigars in any well. This has long been overdue on cigars. Here's what was in it. Husking pegs, husking hooks, thumb stalls, all the contraptions you put on your hands to harvest corn. And for some reason, that really ignited my desire to collect more primitive agricultural things. Now, keep in mind, Margie was from the city. She, we hadn't been home to the farm all that many years when she alone went to this farm auction, probably elbowed her way through to that hay rack and found this box and said, I'm going to buy that. <laughs> she said, there was an advanced man in age next to her and said, lady, what do you want that for? She said, I want that for my husband. What's he going to do with that? I think he'll like that. Well, later on, she found out he was an antique dealer. <laughs> and so they had a great experience in knowing one another. So that's what started it all. So one night, soon after I built this building, neighbor and I had been to a farm auction over east of Bloomington, about 35 miles. And I found a 1917 wooden slat manure spreader. Bought it, put it on the trailer. I said, Charlie, let's take our time going home. I'd like to arrive home after the cover of darkness on this one. So we did, we had dinner, and it started drizzle rain. And I turned the lights off in the truck, came in that east drive, came around here, backed up to this shed, quietly opened this door, getting by famously, and I heard this voice. And just what do we have here we can't get along without? I said, a 1917 manure spread. That was one of the first implements to go in this building. So, that's the way it goes. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about some of the, uh, the implements that you have in here. Well, we started with corn implements over here in the north wall because corn is king. And there I have some old jab planters used before mechanical planters. Uh, and then some early horse planters dating back to about 1860, 65, up through to the more modern horse planters before the tractor planters came into existence. And then if we go down that line, we'll see cultivators and the old stoves. And through this area, our transportation is life-size, hand-carved wooden horse. It came from New York City. I bought it at auction in Pennsylvania. But this horse was carved for Coffin Brothers Harness Company in New York City. They made harness, but they also sold riding togs. And so when they, when they made the harness, they needed a, an animal to make sure everything was right. And when people bought riding togs, they wanted to mount this horse in front of a big mirror to look in the mirror and see if everything is in proper perspective. So I bought this at a public auction. And uh, the reason I know the history is a curator from Long Island, a lady, came up so excited. She said, do you know what you just bought? Well, of course I didn't, and she explained it all to me. I said, now look, when I repaint it, oh, no, don't, don't repaint it. Don't do that. And I said, the pigeons have been roosting on it. She said, take burlap and wipe it off. Thank goodness for her, this horse is original, and it has all the component parts that should be there. But there were two significant parts missing. Number one, the ears. The ears were gone, and the muzzle. And we used some photographs that we'd taken of the royal family horses over in Vienna, Austria, where we met and were married. And the woodcarver then used those ears in that picture and a muzzle to put this horse back. And then this lady said to me, when you repaint those parts, do not make them look original. Let people know that these are replacement parts. So we got hold of um, the same lady that did my portrait. She painted then these new parts for, I call him Woody. Woody the horse. He's hollow. He's a pine horse but they have all the muscles and the tendons so that his, I'm really proud to have that animal in its state being. He's a cheap keeper too. And if Marge wants to go for a bobsled ride, well, he's all ready for her. 
That bobsled was made up in Wisconsin, where they make automobiles today. It was uh, in a shop, a farm, actually a farm machine shed, full of sacks, corn sacks, barbed wire, numerous other things, no paint, but the wood was solid. I took it to a restore out in Indiana, and he is magnificent. He has all the capabilities to bring that back into life, probably even more handsome than it was originally. This buggy, that's called a fold down top Surrey. Again, it had no leather left on it, no upholstery. Uh, and this gentleman out there also had great skills. Six coats of hand rubbed enamel. My paternal, no, my maternal grandfather lived about 15 miles from here and he made shoes and these are the tools of his usage only he didn't he, these weren't the ones he had but there's an exhibit of how the old boots and shoes were made years ago show us that letter that you that you have on display pardon the, the letter no. that you have on display and back here you know there's certain things that you have that you might see at an auction, and it really said, I've got to buy that. And I had this old, old painting of Abraham Lincoln. It has damage. The frame is old, not well done. But this letter, this letter, when I saw it on a hay rack at an auction, I said, I've got to have that and there's where it will be, right next to Abraham Lincoln. And this is a story to a lady, a lady who lives in Boston, Massachusetts, or did at that time. The date of the letter is Washington, November 21st, 1864, from the Executive Mansion. Dear Mrs. Burpee, Boston, Massachusetts, dear Madam, I have been shown in the files of the Department of War a statement of the Adjutant General of Massachusetts that you are the mother of five sons who have died gallantly in a field of battle. Just think, during that war, with the pressures of war, he still had it in his heart the necessity of writing to this poor lady who's who lost her who, five who, who wrote that letter? Who wrote that letter? And it's signed, A. Lincoln. The last sentence. Yours very sincerely and respectfully, A. Lincoln. There it is, by this gentleman who held so dearly the importance of life, the preservation of life, and the preservation of the Union but he didn't forget the individuals. Here's something here that's American too. A friend of mine gave me this old trunk to be in his collection. You notice the rat holes? You notice it's pretty basic. Not much in there. But listen to what it said. This wheeled chest once contained the belongings of David S. Miller, who in 1846, at the age of 16, traveled down the Ohio River, then up the Illinois River, finally settling in a village that eventually became Bureau Junction, Illinois. Being without education and the ability to read or write, he found employment with a local doctor to attend and drive his horse and buggy at $5 a month. Mr. Miller, however, did possess some favorable attributes. For as a youth of his time and age, he measured seven feet, two and a half inches tall and weighed 285 pounds. Records do not reveal the basis for his success. However, at his death in 1900, 
he had become the owner of more than 14,000 acres of farmland in Illinois and Iowa. Truly history, opportunity, opportunity, if you had the will, the insight, and the determination. And obviously, my friend Carmine Miller's grandfather did have and did possess those qualities. That sort of backs up what we're talking about this morning. What built America? What built America? And those qualities and the opportunity of individuals. So great. Indian artifacts. I found very few of these. Only one arrowhead right here. Most of these I would be at a farm auction before people really got so keen in bidding so high in these artifacts. I'm very proud of this. Again, that same gentleman, Carmi Miller, and, uh, gave me a great hand in placing these artifacts in a manner that people enjoy looking at. Water, of course. Well, I would say that these little items that you see here, these are parts of houseware goods, uh, undergrounds, underneath the house where Carmine was born and raised down along the Illinois River at Bureau Junction. The peace pipes and all the other things. Water was important here in the prairie and the prime property to build was next to a creek where there's wooded land and also a piece of prairie to grow crops. And water in this area is from a dug well about 30 feet deep. They use wooden pumps, and wooden drop pipes. These are hollowed out. And here's the tools that you use to hollow them out. And drop the pipe in there. And of course, you dig the hole about three feet in diameter. Line it in brick. Put a wooden cover on the top, a wooden pump, and a handle. You pump the water. And there's several examples of wooden pumps. And then Chicago. What did Chicago do to distribute their water? They used wooden pipes. Well, here's a cross-section of a wooden pipe from Colorado. This pipe was about a, two and a half, about two miles long, and you see it's made from, uh, from pine trees, and it was there a hundred years in use. You notice how the water eroded the wood from going through that pipe all those years. And you also notice that there was a metal strap that went around that pipe. And here's the component parts, of course, for our wooden pump and the drop pipe. These are various kinds of pumps. These had chains and cups. And here's up on the wall you can see a different kind of a chain and cup. These would go around this newer mode of bringing water up from from the well below. And the old horse tank, that's made from a big log, cut the log in two and then, and then hollow it out and pump the water in with the old wooden pipe for your horses and cattle. And all the pitchforks, of course these are new on the other wall we have wooden ones, these are all metal. And mother had washing machines and the oldest one first. These washing machines, of course, were wooden. You did it by hand. This is all wood, scrub. You notice where it's worn? Right here in the middle. Well, I'm going to show you what a neighbor did. This is called a Mother Hubbard washboard. The Hubbard family had a sawmill about two miles north of here, and they decided to uh, expand their operation, so they made these. Mother Hubbard washboard. And I can imagine at the Bureau County Fair, it's been going on for 150 years, someone from that sawmill, we'll call him Sam Hubbard, said, folks, step right up here. I'm going to show you the finest, finest, I've talked about technology now, the finest way to clean your clothes. One turns right, one turns left, one turns right. So your clothes stay right where you put it, and it turns and it turns. You're not going to get slivers on your fingers, lady. You just keep rubbing them, and that's just going to ooze. 
to soil out those dirty clothes and not hurt your hands one bit. These are so sweet to use, you're going to enjoy them. We have three sizes, and the large size is 30 cents, middle size is 29 cents, and the smallest is only 15 cents. Lady, step right up here and buy your favorite size scrub board, the Hubbard scrub board. Now, that's probably the way he went as he's selling these. Now they're collector's items. And here on the back, it gives you direction how to use them. All printed in there. Mother Hubbard washboards. Of course, there are a lot of kinds of Hubbards, a lot of kind of boards. So we use this when we have our show. And back on the other part, we'll look at it after a bit. The dog walks in this treadmill. A belt then goes to this washing machine. As he walks, he washes the clothes in soap and water. And you take them out there, those clothes, and you put them in this clean water and rinse them. And then you, she turns the crank, takes the water out, then she hangs them up to dry. We have two colors of these long johns, both white and red. So <laughs> the people enjoy that too. Here we have the Beyond the washing machines, this is a dairy operation. And this is a machine that Marjorie used when we came home from overseas. Our first children were born in 1947, twins, and she pasteurized the milk that we milked here from our cows. So this is a, a home pasteurizer when you didn't get city milk. And these are the various things used in the dairy. The man came to check the butter content of the herd and he put these little tubes of milk in this centrifuge and when he'd do that then you could read the butter fat content of the milk. You did that every month when you were selling your milk so you, they could show what the butter fat content was of the milk they were buying. The old split wooden basket at the, for apples and various churns. Now we go into the ice commode. This little chest here is for 25 pounds of ice with a place to put your food of an appropriate size for that amount of ice. And this is different. It's the only one I've seen. And it says plainly here on this mirror in the back, this is for fresh ice cool Lonies chocolates, and it says here in this brass plate that this is made over in Michigan. Glass all around. When I bought this at a farm auction, it was painted white. The glass is broken, full of oil cans and wrenches and various tools needed in the shop. But I thought I could see a potential. And if we come around here, look at the front, we'll notice that this ice chest is made of very nice poplar wood. This is all original hardware. I just had it re-nickeled. And in here at the bottom is a box of Loney's chocolates. Of course it's empty but there's a real story on it. And there's some fudge candy. And in this one here we've added a little color. And here's a nice ice cream sundae of fresh strawberries and blueberries. But, but, this was brought by our Japanese daughter from Japan, and of course her neighbor made it. It's all plastic, but it looks so real. Invited my good friend Boone Consul. Boone got something for you. He sat down at the table, and here's his spoon mark. But it didn't penetrate. I'm going to get you steel for that. So, this is a little international flavor. And as a Real kicker, this is so efficient, the ice hardly melts. Now if we could have the camera over here to look for the ice chamber. Look at that. That'll hold 100 pounds of ice in there. But of course this isn't. This is modern plastic. It only looks like ice. And here's the story of ice from our local paper, and I remember Ed Hansen, he would park his truck out in front and he'd see the sign that mother would have in the front window. Whichever number was up is the number of pounds that she would want. 25, 50, 75, and 100. 
So he would chip off that amount of ice, bring it in, and put it in the ice box. And that's the whole story of producing ice, how it was done, and that's, of course, before refrigeration. And the thing that prompted these to happen was a railroad. The railroads needed ice to transport farm products from the West Coast to the East Coast in the Middle West, California farmers or Florida farmers. And that started really moving that ice product and brought about refrigeration. Are you getting tired?